Second Chronicles chapter number 5, verse number 1. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Thus all the work of Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. I come to preach to you tonight on this subject, the result of a dedicated temple. The result of a dedicated temple. Precious Lord, I thank you for every soul that is gathered in this house tonight. But more than that, I thank you for your presence that is here. God, I'm asking you tonight that your word would go forth with free course and liberty. And it would accomplish the purpose that you sent it tonight. I'm praying that every heart and every mind and every soul and every spirit would be open to what you want to do and sensitive to the moving of your spirit. For God, there is a very real touch of your presence that is here tonight. Have your way in this place, holy God. Let your work be done, and we're going to give you praise for it. And everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. And if you're going to help me preach and let the Lord have his way, you can be seated. It had been a work. That was in progress and lasted for seven years. Seven years. For seven years, Solomon worked with one thing in mind. And that's building the temple of the Lord. For seven years, Solomon and the people of Israel worked on the house of God. And that was all that was on their mind. Multitudes of multitudes and multitudes of men put their life on hold and gave all of their time, their effort, their energy, their silver, their gold, and anything else that was needed to build the temple of the Lord. Seven years, can you imagine? Now, I've built a few houses in my life. And I think the longest one that we ever built was seven months. <clears throat> it was a beautiful home. 6,000 square feet. One of those poor little old farmers in the Delta owned. Poor little farmer. Seven months, we worked on this house. To make sure it was as close to perfection as we could get it. Day in and day out we would labor. But they didn't spend seven months. They spent seven years. Seven years of very meticulous care was taken. They made sure that all the materials that were used in this house was the best of the best. They made sure that great care was taken as every stone was put in place. As the foundation was laid and a stone was placed upon stone. I, I just want to create a picture for you tonight of the awe that those men had. I'm sure every day, Brother Adcock, that they stepped on the site with a vision in mind. We're going to build a house for the Lord. We're not here to build a shack. We're here to build the grandest building that's ever built in history. And we're doing it just for the Lord. And day in and day out, they would show up on the site. And there was blood, sweat, and tears. I know the Bible don't say so, but if you've ever been in construction, I can assure you 
if you spent seven years on a job, there was lots of sweat. There were surely some days, there were some tears. And sooner or later, somebody spilt some blood somehow, some way. But they were willing to give it all to build a tabernacle for the Lord to dwell in. I can almost see it as the foundation was laid. They began to go up with each stone. And day in and day out, every stone would be put there and it would get a little higher. And people would stand in amazement and all the house of God is going up. Until finally the last stone was put in place. The roof was put over the top. The outer part of the building was done. Now the inner work was to begin. They didn't hire the slouchiest people in the land to work on the temple. In every area they took the finest craftsmen that there were. The finest bricklayers. The finest men that would carve wood. The finest men that would work with silver and with gold. For everything had to be just right. Because they were working on the temple of God. They wanted it to be the best of the best. And after seven long years, the building was finished. Can you imagine what it was like the day that the last ornament was put in place? I can just imagine people standing outside gazing as now there begins to be a caravan of priests that began to bring the instruments into the temple. The furniture. The table of showbread. The altar of incense. The golden candlesticks. And all of the instruments that was related to the duty of the house of God. They began to make their way into the temple. Instruments that had been dedicated sanctified and set apart just for the service that they were about to take place. And then finally, the grandest thing of it all, after everything was put in place, here comes those priests with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, representing the presence of God. And they began to put it in place. And that takes us to where we started reading. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished and Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. And Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chiefs of the fathers of the children of Israel under Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David which is Zion. Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priest and the Levites bring up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. I wonder what would happen if we had that type of reverence for the house of God that we're in. That we came in with sacrifices that could not be told or numbered for multitude. You see, if we're not careful, we come into the house of God to get Instead of give. But I wonder what would happen. If we showed up with a sacrifice of praise and worship. That couldn't be counted. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto its place. To the oracle of the house and to the most holy place even under the wings of the cherubims. And the cherubims spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. 
and they drew out the staves of the ark. Well, why do you think they drew out those staves? Because they weren't intending for the presence of God to go anywhere else. You see, we're living in a generation if people have a visitation of God, they feel like they're really doing something. But God doesn't intend to have a visitation in our life. It's the will of God for us to have a habitation of His presence. God doesn't want to come and go in our lives. God wants to come and stay in our lives. That's why they took those staves out because they weren't intending on moving it again. They were going to leave it there. And they drew out the staves of the ark that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle, but they were not seen without. And there it is under this day. And there was nothing in the ark save two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb. Just hang with me. I know where we're going tonight. Just let me lay a little foundation. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb. And when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified. I want you to pay attention to what's going on. Everything in the temple is put in place. The temple is prepared. The presence of God is present. The word of God is present. Now the priest were sanctified and did not wait then by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, and all of Asaph of Heman, of Jadathan and their sons and the brethren being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding the trumpets. And it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. And what was the reason for the music? To make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. That's the purpose of our music. It's not for entertainment of man, but it's to entertain the presence of God. It's to lift up our voices and our talents unto the Lord and give Him praise. And when they lifted up their voice, you mean our worship is supposed to have noise to it? It's more than just the people that play the instruments, but there's a voice involved, yes. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Second Chronicles 7 and 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all of the children of Israel saw how fire came down, I want you to hear what the response ought to be when the presence of God comes in. When all of the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, and the glory of the Lord upon, their, upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement, and they worshipped, and they praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, and His mercy endureth forever. 
Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen. 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So that the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priest waited on their offices and the Levites with the instruments of the music of the Lord. And David the king had made to praise the Lord because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry and the priest sounded the trumpets before them and all Israel stood. Moreover Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings. And the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. I want you to think about that just for a minute. Solomon didn't build just some little bitty rinky dinky altar, he built a very big altar. But the Bible says that the sacrifice was so great that Solomon's altar couldn't even hold it all. That he had to make a big area in the court for hallow ground to hold all the sacrifices. Also at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days. How many days a week is our worship supposed to be? Seven. Not just Sunday. Not just Wednesday. But our worship and our lifestyle is a seven day affair. And all the Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. If they could put that much effort into a physical building that no longer stands, how much effort should we put In the tabernacle that the Bible says was not made by hands. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You can put a value on silver, you can put a value on gold. You could put a value on the fir wood and the cedars that were used in the house of Solomon built. But the Bible says if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul, what has he profited? You are a temple that has more value than Solomon's temple ever dreamed of having. And I'm going to tell you what I felt in my office tonight. Sister Jackie, if you'll come to the keyboard. Let me tell you what's been happening around here. God has been doing a work of sanctification. And He's been preparing some vessels for service in the house of the Lord. He's been sanctifying some priests and sanctifying some vessels and he's been putting some things in place. You've been allowing to do that in your life. And the Word of God has been present. I want you to pay attention to the the three prevalent things that were present. The Word of God was present. Worship was present. And then his wonder was present. 
I'm going to tell you what I feel like the Lord wants to do in this house tonight. You've already heard the word of the Lord. Now God is looking for some worshipers. Some worshipers that will come before him with a sacrifice that does not have limitation. Sacrifice that is without number. That can't be measured. He's looking for some singers and some instrument players. And some people that have prepared their bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And I just felt real strong in my office, Brother Hancock. That the Lord wanted to come down and dwell in this house tonight. In a very powerful way. It's almost like I could see as our worship began to go up. Just like on the day when Solomon dedicated the temple. His glory began to descend. And it's almost like I could see the glory of God descending in this place. You see, this is a little different for us tonight because we're so used to what happens in the service to be upon the shoulders of the pastor or the preacher. But tonight, what happens in the remainder of this service is not on me. It's on us all. I just wonder if there's anybody in this house tonight that have a heart greater for God than those Israelites in the Old Testament that said, I've come with a sacrifice unto the Lord tonight. And He's given so much to me if I could just give a little bit back to Him. As a matter of fact, if I could just give it all back to Him without number and without measure. I just wonder if there's any temples in this place tonight that are willing to be dedicated unto the Lord. Maybe, maybe along the way somewhere you've allowed distractions to come. Your dedication has slacked a little bit. Maybe somewhere along the way you've allowed a little carnality to enter in. And you're not as clean as you once was. Maybe you used to be a real exuberant worshiper. But you've been entertained by the world so long that it's been a while since you just entertained the presence of God. The end result of a dedicated temple is the fire and the glory of God dwelling in your life. But it won't happen if you approach Him carelessly. It won't happen if you approach Him without sanctifying yourself. If you're here tonight and you've allowed sin in your life, you need to take care of that first. By finding your way to an altar and saying, Lord, I know that I've failed you and I've sinned against you. and God, I want to live my life a different way. I want to dedicate my life to you. Forgive me, Lord. I want everything that I am and everything that I have to be dedicated for your service. Not just on Sunday. Not just on Wednesday, but seven days a week, God. I want the altar in my life to be full of sacrifice unto you. And God, I don't want to just come to you with a stingy hand, just giving a little here and there. But God, if, if in the Old Testament, people that didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost could come and they could give all that they had and they could give sacrifice without 
without number and multitude than God, how much more do I want to give everything that I have in my life to you without measuring it? I want my life to be a sacrifice, Lord. Because I want your fire to be upon my altars. The altars of my heart. The altars of my spirit. God, I want you to fill this temple with your glory. Is there anybody in this house tonight that feels that way as we stand together?